Hello and welcome to the final video, well, final, apart from maybe a few little tweaks and changes, of this quad build that I did over Christmas 2024. It stopped snowing long enough for it all to melt here in the UK, so we had an opportunity to go out and actually give this thing a fly to see how it performed. That's kind of where the rubber meets the road, and you can find out exactly how well you've built it and how it's actually all going to fly. Now, this has gone through a couple of final things uh, that I did in between the last video. Again, go check out the entire series if you want to see me building this. And again, this isn't designed as a how-to series. I've just kind of used things that I had in the Armatan frame for review, the TBS Lucid Pro Stack, um, and just kind of put it all together and not knowing how it was all going to work and having to do a bit of problem solving along the way. So before I flew it, I did balance the props. I know that sounds a bit weird, particularly if you're a multi-rotor pilot. It's force of habit for me. Anything over five inch props, I tend to balance them, particularly when you are using longer arms. Any kind of vibration out in the motors gets transmitted and amplified through the arms. And if you're unlucky enough to hit kind of the sympathetic vibration of the frame, the whole thing is going to vibrate like crazy and that's just going to mess up your video. As I talked about in the last couple of videos, I've been kind of thinking that these motors and props, again, these are these uh, Emacs Eco 1700 kV motors with 7-inch props, that these were potentially a little bit much for this. Quick test hover showed me that that was the case. It's hovering at about 16, 15% throttle on the battery when it's fully charged. So that means the hover throttle in iNav, so that I can try position hold, has been set to 1150. That is insanely low. This can definitely handle a much bigger battery than the 1500 milliamp battery that I'm flying it on now. But let's just get this main initial flight over with and then who knows we might play with things later on recalibrated the compass at the back uh, just to make sure now everything else is all bolted and put together that that's okay other thing i did was i did change the divider for the voltage the voltage for the battery was under reading very slightly so i just changed the divider in inav so it was spot on and that was about it really set the flight mode so that i could take off and fly around in angle for safety first of all then horizon then the top position being position hold so i could park it in the sky and see how well that works and then obviously return to home set up it on the switch as well so that i could see if all that worked how it actually worked with a maiden flight with iNav well with any quad really i would recommend don't try and boil the ocean your first time out make sure it flies make sure you can see everything make sure that the basic modes work make sure that nothing is coming down hot or smoking and everything is all tickety boo that once you have it flying and it's okay, try position hold. That'll tell you that the GPS and compass are okay. Once that's all working, then try a return to home. But be ready to flick it back into something like an angle or horizon mode to get it back and land it safely if it misbehaves or suddenly when you flick return to home, it takes off in the opposite direction that you need. So let me get into the flying footage. I need to say a massive thank you to a flying buddy of mine who was there for moral support and to use the hat cam. This is Adam. Adam, thank you so much, mate, for doing this and helping me out with this. I really, really appreciated it, particularly as it probably been seven, eight weeks since I'd flown everything up with the run up to Christmas, the weather being so bad, and then us having the snow here in the UK in this part of the world. So flying footage, let me talk about what I found. So as you saw, the way it works here is that I tend to plug the model in, let it get a GPS lock first. I now have Lua script on the radio is going to tell me when the GPS has a lock. The motors are also going to beep to let me know that that has happened and it's all ready to fly. Once it's ready and only when it's ready, I plug the walk snail unit in. That just stops it overheating. Less of an issue on a morning like this where it's actually reasonably cool. The walk snail unit will keep itself pretty okay, but it's just a habit that I've got into. Oh, one thing I did mention, I have also put a little cable tie around the capacitor just to make sure if there is any vibration, that isn't going to be shaken around and potentially short on the frame. So initially taking off in angle mode, uh, very quickly started to see that there were issues with the walk snail reception. Maybe the antenna needs to be a little bit higher at the back. But hopefully you can see here, top right hand corner, we are hovering at a really low throttle level. Um, 
15, 16% and it sat there absolutely beautifully. One thing that both Adam and I noticed at this point was that it is very, very quiet and feels very smooth. And looking at the video, you can't actually see any jello as I'm flying around in angle mode, just testing everything is working okay. Signal strength is good and walk snail is actually working beautifully as well. However, I am losing bits of the on-screen display. So I'm definitely going to probably redesign that antenna mount at the back to be able to put the walk snail antenna a little bit further away from the Express LRS stuff. Now, one thing you might have spotted in the lower left-hand corner, we have things like the battery voltage and we also have the current draw as well saying that it's between two and a half and three amps. I absolutely don't believe that. It would have been amazing if that's what it had ended up as, but that is under reading. So that's something that we're gonna to have to fix after the flight. But that means that we'll probably end up playing with the battery to try and sort that out, um, just to see how much is actually taken out the battery versus what the flight controller thinks from the current sensor. It's just going to be the ratio is going to need to be tweaked there's loads of videos on how to do that, but if you want me to show you how to do it, do pop a comment down below. Next thing to do then as it was flying around was try it in good old position hold. So put it in position hold and see whether or not it was going to maintain its position and height and whether or not that hover throttle was about right. And it's working beautifully. I can move it around, I can take my hands off the sticks and it's just sitting in the air. This is a great indication that lots of things are working well. The compass is working well, the GPS is working well, the barometer potentially working well, and my hover throttle was probably not a bad guess. Now I know that position hold is working, we can try a return to home. So I'll fly it a little bit further away, and then when it's far enough away, because if it's too close to you, if you initiate return to home, it will just basically land. We'll hit the hit. We'll hit that and we'll see it fly back to the location. And actually, surprise, surprise, this is working absolutely beautifully too. Frustrating that the telemetry from the walk cell unit isn't working great. I do set it up so that the walk cell unit isn't recording locally. But again, I think that's probably an antenna position issue. And I'll probably just redesign that back piece to move it up a little bit out of the way. But now I'm flying it around. I know that the vibration is okay. The compass is okay. The GPS is okay. The tune's pretty good. In fact, for a maiden flight, this is working really well. However, one thing that I need to figure out is how much current is this actually pulling when it's flying around? These motors and props are hardly getting warm at all because they're pretty much doing nothing, running at about 15, 16% throttle just flying around. And probably saw there in the top right hand corner, I really didn't get anywhere near full tilt, although flippy floppy, it did quite well. So the way I've done this is brought it back, plugged it into the battery checker just as a quick and dirty check. The battery checker is showing that it has 35% left. That means that 65% of the battery was used as part of the flight. That doesn't sound too bad. However, a much more accurate way to check it is to plug it in to the battery charger and charge it back up and see how many milliamp hours go back in to the battery compared to what I got in my on-screen display and my summary information. Now the total flight time on that maiden flight was about 5.6 minutes. So just from the battery checker, we can work out how much has been actually taken out of the battery because if the battery capacity is 1500 and we multiply that capacity by 65%, that gives us 975 milliamps as a very rough and ready idea of how much was pulled out of the battery. However, going through and sticking it on the charger, and we can actually see that it put back in 875 milliamps. Now that 875 milliamps was used in about 5.6 minutes. So if we do a little bit of simple mathematics, we can figure out that the average current draw during the maiden flight was about 8.25 amps overall, which is just over two amps per motor which is around what I was expecting when we did that first look, looking at the thrust tables. So that's kind of in line with what I was going to expect. And excitingly, that could be supported easily with something like lithium ion. Now the reported milliamp hour usage was only 213 milliamp hours from the OSD and the onboard current sensor. So now I know that it actually used 875, I can change the divider in iNav to get that a lot closer. 
And that's the kind of range that lithium ion could absolutely manage. And because it has so much thrust, we could definitely put a bigger battery on here and extend the flight time by quite a significant amount. So in summary, it flies. And actually, it flies really well. Um, not the pure endurance machine that I originally set out to. Um, because of the motor and prop setup, it's much more powerful than that and capable of probably some very high speeds and some probably quite impressive acrobatics, even though it's a slightly bigger model. Lower KV motors would probably give me more endurance. Uh, if you have a suggestion for the motors that would work on a frame like this of about 700 grams, up to 800, 850 if I put a bigger battery on it. That would be really interesting. I think 1700 kV is way too much with this. I think maybe more like a 13, 1400 kV motor for the 4S setup that I'm using this on would be absolutely loads. But again, if you have any suggestions, please, please let me know. Um, I'd be tempted to get another set of motors in, swap these out and see what difference it makes. Even in this configuration, with that kind of current draw, that means that Something like a lithium ion pack, a 21700 4S pack could absolutely work on something like this. And using something like a P42A or similar cells, they can easily support that kind of current. And you can get them in, I think, 4200 milliamp hours. That would mean that this could fly about five times longer than it actually did in that test flight. So flights of around 25 minutes would be possible. However, I think we could definitely improve the efficiency by having a better motor setup tuned more for low amp draw than these things which are actually quite beasts with this light frame. So there are a couple of things that I need to do now. I need to probably redesign the back mount here, lift this Walkson antenna a little bit more out the way so that I can actually get better telemetry. I need to go and tweak the divider for the current sensor and I'm still not getting any beeps or chirps or anything out of that lost model alarm, the Vifly alarm that I put at the front. If you have using a TBS Lucid Pro and you've got one of those working, please get in touch. I'm obviously missing something obvious, but it does show that when you're building one and you're putting components together that you haven't seen somebody do before, it is a bit of a journey and it's a bit of experience. But if you've never built a quad before, do check out my quadcopter building for beginners series because it is a fantastic feeling when something that you have built over a week of dark, cold, rainy nights goes to the field and actually flies. So thank you for watching. Hope that's been fun. Again, if you have any suggestions or ideas, do pop them in a comment below. Thank you for watching my video. Check out the playlist and adding Painless 360 to your search terms will help you find my content. If you haven't done so already, please hit the like and subscribe button. It helps a lot. You can support the time I spend here answering questions and helping others by using the links in the video description.